Life's too short to drive boring cars. So if you're like me, you just bought your brand new car, you're all excited, you're ready to go and you just wanna enjoy the best of it. But did you realize from the day that you drive that car off the lot, you're causing irreversible damage and essentially, if you don't know what you're doing, you're drastically reducing the lifespan of your brand new car. I wanna share a list of six ways that you are destroying your engine and how you can actually prevent doing so. Let's get into it now. So let's take it from the top. You buy this great new car. Let's take a look around. Beautiful alloy wheels, shiny new paint. And when you take it off the lot, you want to do the little things to make sure that you're keeping it in good shape. For example, a lot of people apply the 3M paint protection film on the body so you don't get rocks and damage on the paint. A lot of times people get the extended warranty to make sure they have coverage for things like glass because when rocks hit the glass often they break and they want to have protection for that. A lot of times people use that paint protection coating to make sure that the shine lasts a long time. So it's great to have this beautiful car but what's the first thing that you're doing to potentially damage your new car investment? Well it's right under there. Here right there you have the gas filler. Remove slowly, typically like any internal combustion engine vehicle, you have a gas filler like this, comes off simple as pie. Put that in and away you go. Now what you'll notice is they always have a rating, an octane level. This one here says minimum octane rating 91. And then they also have extra detail right in there as well. But let's close that up and explain. The problem is in today's day and age, oil and gas cost so much money. So a lot of manufacturers are finding cheaper ways to manufacture product so you can pump fuel into the tank of your great new car. But the problem is, unless you're buying the premium and the best grade of fuel, often what you're getting is an ethanol blend. In other words, they're blending a percentage of alcohol with regular fuel and often it even increases the octane rating of that fuel as well. So it appears to have a win, but it's actually a negative in all counts and here's why when you're running your car that fuel pumps through the system the fuel starts in your tank the fuel pump then pushes it through a fuel filter and then into the injection system which injects it through numerous fuel injectors right into the cylinder either directly or indirectly through a common plenum and all those parts are potentially at risk so why are they at risk well what happens is when you actually have alcohol in your fuel if it sits for any significant amount of time it starts to separate then what you have is at a molecular level you have water separating from the fuel and now you have moisture and co condensation moving through your system so you can have pockets of water that can actually ruin your fuel injectors that can ruin your fuel pump and if it gets bad enough it can migrate its way into engine components for example rod bearings cam lobes and you can find yourself with severe internal corrosion issues and that in itself will start to take a toll on the condition of the internals of that engine there's two ways you can solve that one is of course with fuel treatment which actually keeps the molecules in its normal state so the water does not separate and the other option is potentially just using the best grade of fuel often if you look at the gas station you'll see they'll even label it on the fuel pump that there's often no ethanol blended in with the premium levels of fuel it's not until you get into the mid grade or lower typically that you're finding larger blends of alcohol or ethanol within your fuel so either use a better grade of fuel or use products to stabilize the water separation so the second way that you could be destroying your engine is actually cold starting your engine of course, we don't have choices sometimes. I mean, we think, okay, cold weather means cold engine and cold start, but it's not just because there's snow on the ground. You can actually be cold starting your engine, even in warmer temperatures, it's still a dry start is what they mean. It generally means a fresh start if the vehicle hasn't been running for numerous hours. That's where all the oil seeps down from the cylinder walls. All of the lubricating surfaces start losing some of that lubrication as all the oil settles back down in the sump. And now when do you go to start your engine in any situation where it hasn't been running for a significant amount of time, it just happens to be even worse when it's cold out. For example, minus 10, minus 20 degrees Celsius, when the oil is really thick and the conditions are even more right for dry, cold starts, that's when you're gonna start seeing wear and tear on your engine. Most vehicles do not have a preheat. A lot of industrial equipment has equipment that has a pre-lube system or preheat. Most vehicles that you see in the streets do not have such equipment. So there's really no way around from starting the vehicle cold sometimes. We all have to do that. We have to get going. We don't have the vehicle constantly running. But the point is frequent start stops. Like for example, you wanna move the 
the vehicle over one space. Maybe resist that start just to move it over five feet. The best thing you can do is reduce the amount of cold starts. So less times you move the vehicle and start, stop, start, stop is the better for it. Now the third way that you could be gently killing your engine is by either neglecting your oil services or adhering to the long extended oil service intervals that a lot of manufacturers were suggesting a few short years ago. Yes, synthetic oil is far better than the old Dino oil from many years ago. However, you can still see sludge formation and oil does in fact start to break down. That does create acids in the oil and you still have a condition where bad oil in the engine actually starts to wreak havoc. So let's take a look under the hood. Now you look under the hood of most vehicles. Here we're looking at a Mercedes and right there they refer to the owner's manual because if you're not sure how often or the type of oil you should be checking, adding or changing with, then you should always refer to the owner's manual right there. There's a dipstick. Many cars have them, but today's day and age, many cars do not have a dipstick and a lot of it's done electronically on the dash. A few years ago, BMW had these long extended oil service intervals. Even if you were listening to what the manufacturer was saying, you really weren't doing your engine any good. And it's not just lubricating the bottom end of the engine. Of course, oil is used to lubricate the crankshaft bearings, the cam lobes, piston rings, and all the other internal parts. But nowadays, oil is even more important because now oil is used to lubricate the turbo bearings, which you have in a lot of modern vehicles. Most of them are turbocharged. But it goes even beyond that as well. Nowadays, if you look at a Mercedes here or a BMW, Mercedes here has a variable valve timing system. So does Toyota and Lexus with the VVTi or BMW and their Vano system and now double Vano system. And there's other systems now are relying even more on the oil pressure and the quality of oil to make sure the vehicles run right. So the variable valve timing really alters the timing of your vehicle through a series of dynamic changes depending on the condition of the drive. As an example, engine RPM. At idle, it's meant to run at a certain timing, and as you accelerate, it'll advance the timing and give you more horsepower, so it'll give you the best driving state. So if you're not changing your oil frequently, there's pumps and solenoids that can all be affected in your variable valve timing if you have bad oil. Your engine can also see problems, again, as I said, with excess moisture and contamination and sludge. That will take a toll on the engine, and I've even seen where turbos start getting coked up. You get bad oil, it starts coking up or starts thickening up the oil feed lines, and what you wind up is a turbo that gets starved of oil and as a result you burn out a turbo and people wonder why oh I burned up two turbos last year on my car and then they get mad because the turbos are cooking often it's a little bit of maintenance and the next area that you can be damaging your engine is by avoiding or ignoring the check engine lights now there's a couple different lights that you can get the yellow check engine light often when you look at your dash here, there's usually a couple of indicators. A yellow check engine light means a warning. There means something's not working quite right and you better look into it. But it means you can continue driving for a short period of time until you're able to fix it. Then there's the red check engine light, which is essentially a fault. And that means something seriously has gone wrong. Something's broken, trip, not happy. And all too often I've seen people neglect their check engine lights. And then they drive for weeks, they drive for months. Usually the system's gonna make a comment it may have to add fuel, take away fuel, alter timing. And now the computers within these complicated new vehicles possibly could be making concessions for any number of other conditions that aren't right within the vehicle. It could be as simple as, as an O2 sensor, which of course, if you're not providing the right sense the right feedback back to the engine. It doesn't know as a point of reference, so it doesn't know how much fuel to add or take away because it's looking at carbon emissions coming out of the tailpipe. So clearly, check engine lights are far more important than you give them credit for. And the infamous, oh, just check your gas cap, that's almost the last thing you're ever gonna have to worry about. I've rarely ever seen the gas cap itself being the contributor to a problem or a check engine light. So be sure to check it. You can do a quick check yourself if you get one of those small diagnostic tools and Usually there's a space under here, there's a port where you can plug in under the dashboard and that will allow you to even check in yourself as a point of reference. If you don't want to take it to the dealer right away, at least understand that there's something going on. But again, if you're not a certified mechanic and you're not, and you're not mechanically inclined, I'd suggest highly that you get your vehicle into the shop as soon as possible. Now another situation is getting home. 
I've just been racing around out on the freeway. I just pulled up to the driveway here and I just turned the car off real quickly. That's another area where you can seriously cause damage to your engine. And a lot of people don't know that, but most vehicles today are turbocharged. This one is turbocharged. It's a two liter four cylinder engine and a turbo attached to it. Virtually every brand, even Lexus has now a two liter turbo four cylinder engine as does BMW and the B48. And virtually every other manufacturer almost has their version of a two liter four cylinder engine with a turbo. And it's that turbo you can wreck it very, very quickly. If you come off hard and fast off a freeway, you turn the ignition off, that's where you're gonna start seeing a problem. And the reason I say that here, here under the hood, this car here has a turbo and you can down, see down there, you have a wastegate, there's a valve there and the turbocharger is down on this side of the engine in this particular circumstance. The problem with that is the vehicle is hot. When you're driving the car hot, the turbo gets very, very hot. The bearings create a lot of heat. And as a result, if you don't let that heat dissipate slowly, what you get is the oil that's supplying. There's an oil feed line that feeds into the turbo and then there's a scavenge line so the oil goes in and through so the oil is constantly feeding through a turbo to lubricate it and help cool it now a lot of turbos also have cooling lines attached to them which help drop the temps down a little bit but that's only marginally effective if you're in a bad habit of driving the car hard and turning it off right away it's that oil that sits that's sitting at that supply line that starts to get cooked because the heat radiates from the bearing housing or the cartridge of the turbo up through the supply line and and starts to harden up and coat that turbo feed line and when that happens it starts to deteriorate it's almost like somebody who eats a lot of fast food their arteries to their heart start to tighten up and of course it even starts to all the plaque buildup starts to reduce the flow to the heart that's the same thing happening with a turbo if you constantly run it hard and turn it off quickly the process of cooking continues and it continues to narrow down the supply line to that turbocharger thus resulting in a very premature failure of the turbo and then again as i say people often wonder why do they blow a turbo possibly because of some of these bad habits old oil and possibly not letting the car idle down for 30 seconds, 45 seconds after a hard drive. Never hurts to let the vehicle run for a minute or so before you turn it off. So the next one actually has a major negative effect on the lifespan of your vehicle. And the worst part is it's a technology that the manufacturers have created and installed in your vehicle. That's right. And what it is, it's this little button. And often you see it's the stop start system. This one's a button here. You can deactivate the system by the press of the button while the vehicle's running. And it's great that you can deactivate it. Apparently many vehicles nowadays are getting rid of that functionality and it's defaulting on all the time, unless you're into a sport mode or something on some of these vehicles. But the reality is with the default, when you start your car up and you go and you drive, once the vehicle's fully warmed up, you pull up to a set of lights or pull up to a stop or a stop sign, the vehicle will stop. It'll turn right off. And you've noticed that in most vehicles today, and it's actually a mandate from a few years ago that every vehicle now has to be equipped with that technology. It's all for the sake of trying to reduce emissions to knock down noxious gases as we all do the best that we can for the environment and to help the planet in the best way that we know how. But the problem is that doesn't do your vehicle any good. And that's why I personally suggest always turning that, that device off when you're driving your vehicle. That's my only personal opinion. You can make those choices yourself for your own personal reasons, but from the longevity of your vehicle's perspective goes that's harmful to your harmful to your vehicle because what it means is every time your vehicle stops you wait at a light maybe sometimes traffic lights are two three four minutes long sometimes okay that's great some of the oil starts to settle down and you have a condition where it's almost a cold start every single time not totally but somewhat a lot of the oil and lubrication is settled out and then you have a bad scene the other part is of course every time you go to take off after it's stopped it goes to restart so the starter's running again so that's extra wear and tear on your starter extra wear and tear on your ring gear which is around your flywheel and that is all wear and tear that's going to cost you in the end and it's potentially going to cost your engine in the long term so personally i'd suggest turning it off if you want to make your engine last longer
And then as a common note, if you want to make sure your vehicle lasts as long as possible and you get the maximum service life out of your engine, general maintenance is a great way to go. Of course, don't forget your coolant changes because old coolant sometimes has an impact on your cooling system, such as water pumps, thermostats, radiators. And if the vehicle ever overheats because of poorly maintained cooling system, that's a quick surefire way to destroy your engine. So be sure you never overheat your engine and take care of your fluids. Now with all of that said, be sure to click on that video, you're going to love it. There's a list of engines that will last forever. Hope to see you real soon. Catch you next time. Bye-bye.